pieces which is always played too fast like that when coming from the original first movement or perhaps first half movement for those of uh, all of us who think it's in two movement altogether with the theme and variations as a second or um, as a third if this is the second but uh, regardless of which way you subdivide it um, coming from this dreamy um, <laughs> in minor dedicated prestissimo is always exaggeratedly fast and the fact is is that the notation is in 6-8 by a group of 8 bars 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, 6, 8 of course the hypermeter a bar a bar a bar a beat and it becomes um, a quick um, in rapid, um, therefore, driven movement in the bass but the dotted quarter which uh, is slurred to three eighth notes in the theme leading to a repeated note by anticipation asks for a little bit of withheld tempo suggest pianistically to jolt the wrist up only on the second repeated note. Therefore the first one stays in position. To obtain this crisp articulation. But because of the dotted rhythm which is uh, slurred to three eighth notes, the last two eighth notes come always too late. Easily uh, shut down to the only 16th notes, possibly even less time to speak, so they're like um, tied up. It's an exaggeration, it has to be played earlier. Naturally, best is to repeat for practicing purposes to know exact value of the eighth notes, which are not so short at the end of the bar, if they are not pushed too far in the bar, therefore the, to have time to speak. But let's say that you play it like written, as it should be. Then comes the point of the fact that the repeated note at the end of the bar is less melodic than the one of the leap of the melodic arpeggio fifth and um, sixth with not arpeggio at least interval sorry well that's the escape if he had written a melodic uh, two eighth notes at the escapement of the dotted quarter for underneath in a certain way, even uh, even catchy because of the um, uh, triton that would have been. I don't think it would have been so bad and people wouldn't have said, oh Beethoven would have never written it, but it's fact that he didn't. And for us pianists, repeated notes are more about sport than art. To make sure that they repeat compared to so we have to be able to play repeated note which is melodic in fact as if it was but uh, so by taking it a bit earlier than later you allow the space of the two eighth notes to be less tight to sixteenth notes, no more, but real eighth notes. So the tempo, that's the reality of it. And if it's a bit slow, even faster. What a difference it makes with the exaggerated. Okay, this is a caricature, but I don't point out to that. But sometimes one hears that. Then there is a Issue is the left hand. Beethoven writes.
it's in octavizations because I am convinced of the fact that the fortepianos in his time, okay, he's deaf at this point at the end of his life, but of course he wasn't born deaf. He knows that the fortepianos, um, straight strung pianos that they were, had beautiful separation, fragmentation of the um, uh, quality of sound for each range, but they didn't mix well, at least balance well. So the basses usually if they had to be symphonic large as he wants and deep, would have lost uh, their energy compared to the uh, melodic line would have been even with only the bottom part played alone today, it balances far more than the right hand it overwhelms unless the right hand plays even more so you could speculate that today he would have perhaps just said okay just one of the two not. so it's fortissimo ben marcato both hands i think in the publisher today it should indicate the left hand mezzo forte mezzo fortissimo <laughs> held sound in order to to have the balance not in disfavor of the right hand obviously not no weak it shouldn't be some kind of um, macaroni on a, uh, on, a, on the keys it should be still brassy and direct sound precise, almost penetrating. This kind of octaves that you have in the recitative of the slow movement of the fourth concerto, but orchestrally. now in the balance of the two hands and also if I want to play fast so to now start counting the beats by bars bar beats so one and five six, so eight and then piano superstitions now, of the substitutions I made. Uh, four, five, three, one into five, and then three, one, two, and sliding from black to white key and substituting for the nips. So this legato four-part string quartet writing, which it is in slow motion. So the ostinato of the dominant is in the cello. The viola opposite direction going up by step or by half step. In dialogue answer to the uh, second violin or first. It is very, very interesting to observe how meaningful it is when the soprano part is slurred on the repeated note, the bebung. It's slurred as a slur as well as a legato, which we don't have in the opening. suggest the bebung, as I used to call it. Like, for instance, uh, repeated notes, melodically so, with change of finger, but slurred. Third uh, cello sonata, um, scherzo, piano part. He indicates the change of finger, 3-2, three, 3-2, two, three, two, with a slur. Speculating that on some 
of the uh, techniques of the past, they were played inside the called bebo, like a vibrato, like augmenting. Ta -ha 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 -di. And you can think. is not repeated obviously but it's um, slurred and this held F um, bridges in a syncopation way because the short uh, va value is slurred to the long the eighth note to the quarter so it's, 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 it's um, creates a, um, a sense of syncopation a bit like in the G major sonata where a sixteenth note is slurred to a quarter note so the quarter of the value prolonged on the quarter note. Here is the third of the values, the eighth note on the quarter. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's catchy, it's anticipated, it's not... <laughs> in tempo. So it has to be soft in dynamics, precise and whispered in the articulation and rhythmically biting. You want to follow all the parts. And then... And then in the four parts... So it's sort of like an 8-bar pendant to the 8-bar fortissimo. Of course, it's indicated pianissimo, but also piano in some editions and with hairpins of expression. And this expression should not be a wave because it will be too extroverted and also it will combine the two parts of the top hand which are to do an imitation of violin one indicated with upper stems and then the violin two indicated with the lower stems and not because then the ear the, the untrained ear uh, um, combines the two parts and one hears that's wrong I mean it's not wrong because it's there and it's the produce of Beethoven's desire to um, uh, mix the two parts in a way that their dialogue in this speed and dynamic softly they um, nurture each other, they interlace each other, but they should be played, I believe, and presented as individual parts. It's difficult to even sing in syncopation. It's jazzy in that sense of the anticipation of the beat as jazz is. independently staccato so that your legato playing in syncopations it doesn't start um, singing more than the rhythmic syncopation demands and your counting doesn't start singing in order to maintain the pulse one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. your conductor in the orchestra, your string quartet. So you have to be quick reacting, articulated and precise but steady in terms of the pulse but in the anticipated rhythms of the eighth notes slur to the quarter notes being always before the beat. So, uh, Here it will be. So it gives a sense of anxiety. So prestissimo is faster than pressed, obviously, rushed than rushed. But um, it has to be rushed to the point to which you can still hear the pulse and the syncopation. After it becomes a race to the abyss. 
and then uh, at one point you crush. Uh, <laughs> Developmental element, no more the string quartet um, genre idiom which he used since the beginning of this movement, but really a two part um, variation, possibly a two part um, invention st style, but mostly a melodic line for the sequence of dropping chromatically. Pages. Granted, he doesn't indicate bottom stems on the beats. It's all piano, even. But it's tempting to uh, voice it out. because this way the bubbly arpeggiations of the left hand they just drop, 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 drip, drop, drip, drop by chromatic drops uh, and the right hand has these leaps of the sixth which drop every two bars by a step until he does the chromaticism for the escape to a fake expectation or lure or a decoy to G, C major sort of a Neapolitan six dominant so this kind of for me burst of expressive endeavor of of um, un adulterated um, thrust forward. <laughs> Piano because in this tempo, uh, diminuendo on two bars is a blink of an eye, so it is quasi uh, almost subito. In a no man's land of left hand uh, ostinato, in a um, dominant with a deceptive cadence of a sixth degree of E minor, and then here stops all motion of eighth notes to go to quarter notes and uh, half notes, dot at all, with an amazingly enigmatic half note ascension through several parts, so you have to become very linear and uh, very um, um, inquisitive, like what's going to happen? Return to the first degree on the second degree, which was in fact the dominant of the dominant. So five of five became a five major to one minor. That's like almost uh, wrong editing or um, um, a denial of modulation, or <coughs> as if this whole sequence of uh, string quartet in large values that follows the um, sort of soft drums uh, ostinato. Navigates through degrees that become almost like getting lost in a, in a maze. Thinking, okay, I'm going to finish on the dominant in order to restart in E minor. And he does 5 1 in E minor, 5 of 5, okay. He 
should have gone anyway to the dominant of E minor, not of B minor, since he wants to return in E minor. A few bars. That would have been what his composition teacher would suggest him if he had one. And not this um, way of getting lost in the space, because by signaling a dominant arrival like this in B, we expect the theme in B minor or in B major. Hopefully not, but nevertheless, these are the options, and therefore the fact that he doesn't is an amazing. Um, for us less because we're used to a tonal and post-tonal music today so little shock our ear and our psyche but for his time period to bring his listener and his performer so far into this dominant of a key in which he's not going to go and just start again in E minor when he stopped for B minor is an amazing effect. That is amazing effect of modernity, of uh, visionary ways to uh, break with the rules. And now why would I have to finish on the dominant in order to start the tonic? I'm going to... It's like a lure. It's like a decoy. It's... It leaves you on, on your toes, panting, like what happened? Why all of a sudden I'm back? My surprise! <laughs> but that was obvious, it's not special. Well, it is beautiful, but it's not striking. Well, everything is striking, but in hierarchy of events, less. And uh, here the repeated notes are three. Sol, 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 la, 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 fa, fa, fa. And you have to really be very driven in order to maintain the tempo of the opening after you have this moment of fermata and stop. Back to the prestissimo. What is difficult is not to be over prestissimo. Yeah, exactly like when you start the movement after the first section in... Uh, by reaction, don't overshoot and start playing. Because then it's A, unplayable, B, un unfreezable in the details. It just becomes uh, a race without um, the capacity to express all the details while driven. Um, and it's often done because of the slower movement before. And same way after middle section being slower, don't overshoot but maintain it in a pulse that is allowing you to always um, control and um, bring to fruition all the elements. Sorry for this. Beethoven, he has this crescendo piano, crescendo forte piano. It is not by itself an effect of unreached climax, it's more about patched harmonic or orchestral fragments that collide or um, appear in a sort of a shadow and light situation and mirror each other. It's very dynamic writing at the same time. Pianistically, one shouldn't diminish it or, or, or reduce it to an expression of a crescendo, oh, piano, yes, but no, no, not that kind of yes, but no, of a later romantic rubato. It's more about, I think, a driven force on different um, layers, and all of a sudden you privilege one. <laughs> Interrupted in its drive by and 
would have been, of course, woodwinds in the orchestra, let's say, compared to strings. So you have to play it like this by fragments that connect, collide, or um, shadow uh, and light um, interact. It's difficult to find always the words, but the idea is to keep the unity of the pulse. <laughs> Inevitably, you don't hear the first soft note because it's taken, absorbed by the resonance and of the piano, regardless even of the acoustic, if more. It's tempting to slow down, to establish it, to make it heard, but then it belittles the structure of the system. It's more like as if uh, you start. Uh, rounding the corners of this um, angular, edged, um, driven, zesty um, motion. You're like in a locomotion that's very intense. It's so a crescendo. Sorry for the bees. gesture of um, not anger. I think, I think, I think, <laughs> I think in it too. Uh, I think in the sense of um, heroic drive forward um, in a certain kind of um, grand gesture that allows for noble feelings to be unadulterated by compromise. You go to the edge of the um, let's say, driven forward tempo, or the withheld anxiety, which bubbles, bubbles, bubbles until it bursts, and then it goes to the next. <laughs> it's so important for the balance of the two hands, not to be prevailing in the left hand, and it becomes angry, or sounds like such. <laughs> not shorten too much the 16th notes, uh, which in fact are 8th. material when just where it's supposed to be in the pulse and with anticipation of the articulation and the precision of the touch it remains an amazingly inspired driven gallop of sorts uh,
big range brings a problem for the balance of the articulations, which in some case derailed, like in my playing, just did, all these uh, left hand uh, basses, or for instance, uh, this exaggerated left hand, which I overpassed, or this. idle left hand is uh, ostinato, from piano became pianissimo, the forte became fortissimo, so these extremes don't value as much the piece as much as the excitement of playing it, so that's another of the temptations for pianists to become overly driven by this very short but compact intense piece where the intensity of the contrasts, it's at the level of the intensity of the music, and perhaps sometimes takes it becomes more than what you planned because you get you, you get um, overwhelmed by the fact of doing it. So you have to be able to control it and play it instead of instead of so by small the, the spectrum is very large if you start very soft or oh, whisper soft compared to the scream the whisper soft. But if you manage to find a balance where you find a framework for the dynamics um, of the um, uh, soundscape of this piece, you will be even more convincing. Uh, of course, it's more difficult because you have to balance the weight of the, uh, of the things between a lesser space. But I think uh, the spectrum um, being more centered, your message will be more driven and at the same time, less exaggerated. But it's tempting to be so. Once you play, you get caught in the playing, the industry of doing it. For instance, in this example of the uh, dominant pedal, or so-called harmonic clip, but what's it called? Ostinato. He has a little um, uh, melodic line which represents the bass line of the opening. because it's every two bars so you shouldn't breathe at the same time but every two like the bottom ends when the top starts breathe on the bottom breathe on the top while the bottom continues so it's interlaced in canon while the bass plays the sort of I think of it more like a um, timpani piano like a drum if you play them triple pianissimo they get faded to a certain extent you don't hear them especially in concert compared to a recording let's say where the mic would be so close to the piano that it can capture any kind of my minimal nano intention but in concert not really and so that's why from should, and from to and from which allows to follow the other parts falling around it like uh, gracefully and this instead of so softly uh, whispered more agitated and articulated bass uh, left hand Because if you shut it down to under piano, even well played, which is not practiced yet uh, enough ever, um, is the question of the fact that it remains blurry. And it has to be clear. It has to be almost spoken. And here's song. So, of course, the value of a piano dynamic marking here with a legato for the song Un poco espressivo, it's written. Compared to this, also written piano value. There should be a piano of 
for the legato or piano for lyrical and piano for driven or piano for rhythmical. Of course, it is piano, but piano doesn't mean anything except, well, it means that it's soft, but it means mostly compared to the texture that it's um, um, driving. Uh, in the same way, there is a crescendo. Sforzando sforzissimo subito, which is tempting dynamically, but it's wrong. It only rises to the forte. So it's very important to manage to balance the criteria of the utter dramatic and cut-edge contrasts that are written by Beethoven at the same time uh, bring them to a closer range in order to uh, maintain um, a framework for this uh, soundscape that is not um, dropping under or screaming above the frame in order to have the quality of sound, precision of sound in any of the dynamics. <laughs> of the sections that have their specificity. Even in the recapitulation, the second uh, time in E minor compared to the first time in B minor. Now, of course, in B minor, in the middle of the key, already a you could argue that it's the same, but of course it's a fourth or fifth above. The piano is more resonant here than as an instrument. And when it continues to rise, compared to here. So I invite the pianist to practice uh, similar sections in connection, just to practice them and observe how they resonate differently. For instance, compared with the second time for the same section, and again, and, and, and say, okay, which one resonates how? So, The first time is, is the G. The second time is the G. This high note in the drop chromatic of the left hand here is a D. F, E. And the second time is an octave higher. to do with range, with resonance, with articulation, with precision, of course. Compared to the first time, one can practice it in a way to obtain more um, immediate reaction of the tempo's uh, notes, but um, in some pianos the instruments, the action uh, lifts slower, or the very hand, the fingers, the cognitive neurological situation between the neurons and the tips of the fingers has to be so immediate and so precise 
crescendo, sorry for the G-sharp, it has to be always delayed. In a way, the crescendo is a good one when it's delayed, and most of it is built by the music itself, not by the energy you put in muscularly, so to say. But only towards the end, when you need to reach the climax, for instance, then you can add some of it. If not, it becomes easily, overwhelmingly um, wavy, and it loses its... Um, general color, so it becomes overcolorized instead of choosing a certain amount of colors that will be the predominant colors of this painting, whether it be gray and dark and black, or and not just all of a sudden have a yellow and a blue and a... Well, it's possible, but it's not what it is. I think in this case it's more driven, uh, austere, and um, extremely um, passionate in the sense of uh, um, uncompromising movement, Co uncompromising with modulations, uncompromising with uh, tempi, uncompromising with um, slurred, slurred and uh, short long values, basically nothing but an amazing track on which you have a train that goes to the abyss in an absolutely organized but seemingly spontaneously driven way. This is uh, what the uh, impression for the listener should remain of. inspiration that Beethoven likely had from the Sarabande of the Goldbergs. Or any other uh, Bach. Probably and likely he was not interested in redoing something of the past in this case because the genre of theme and variations is uh, the genre of his century um, but uh, most time not on their own theme in this case it is and what is so incredibly unexpected in this is that um, uh, the way he treats the variations is not so developmental and what is striking in the um, uh, usage of the 4-4 four, four bar uh, plus 4 bar um, hypermeter is that in the middle, when he goes to the dominant, of the dominant, he indicates the crescendo with the passing tone, the dominant 7 back to the tonic E major, in order to bridge and to make it an 8 bar super structure rather than well eight bar beats so what is interesting is that he doesn't resolve the seventh down as he should in the case of the secondary dominant he should resolve the E to the D sharp the triton has to resolve by opening therefore here he does which is a voice leading heresy. But at the same time, um, instead of giving the sense of tension and release, if it was done the orthodox way, by doing this, you feel like something is calling you to go further. You don't relax here, it's a bridge. It's not the end of the first, fourth note, a bar beat of the phrase. by the non-resolution of the tension release and then on the sixth chord 
the beginning of the second half of the sentence, he, um, by this um, purposely written um, voice-led mistake of uh, lifting the seventh, he goes to the G sharp, therefore to the B, he ascends. in the bass is not gratuitous because you're still in the resonance of the secondary dominance leading tone, secondary leading tone, the A sharp, 5 of 5 or 7 of 5 of 5. Well, they are not played against each other, they are slightly off but enough to be Cantata Tour 2 bit Bach, or Beethoven, uh, Freudian slip um, in G major when um, the voice uh, and the oboe are in their interlaced dialogue. It's a marriage cantata, so it has this kind of uh, sense of uh, freshness for it. Um, uh, dominant. And here we have... So it's almost unnecessary though the publisher had to put a hairpin for the interpretation to suggest that you don't want tension release and then build a crescendo. You want to crescendo on the secondary dominant and not release. release, he flattens the sixth degree to bring it half step closer to the dominant, hug the dominant with this uh, low appoggiatura dark in it he should have made with a diminished seventh or with a five or five, but from there to this to that. Adding more makeup, making the eyes more dark, therefore more striking, and therefore even more meaningful the resolution. And how does he resolve this time the dominant? Without the fifth, which he had in the bridging of the apparently wrongly resolved um, voice led the dominant uh, with the seventh going up. And here the E. Resolves without an F sharp, just a major third, unison, which we should have had here, yet he wanted to do it parallel. But it's a way to say the first arrival of the dominant is not yet musically the moment to relax. You want to keep psychologically manipulating your listener to go further. So the melody is simplistic, very simplistic. that brings it to have this phrasing, articulation, direction, line, attention span, and of course the tempo, andante, not andagio, it has to be walking, as it's mean, and singing. It's like almost as if visually he rises over his bench on musical terms. The second half of the theme is also a perfect cadence in the fourth bar in the relative minor, the closest cousins, G sharp minor, with F double sharp, the secondary leading tone, but this time. He resolves 
as the rule says, bring down the seventh, unison or third, but no fifth. And he does have a hairpin breaking down to the diminuendo. And then you start from the second degree to the fifth, with the arpeggiation bringing to the major ninth uh, more than the major dominant seventh. It's a major ninth. Uh, dominant ninth to extend the tension and then release which is to say that is eight bars plus four and four and not four four and four four another thing which is important to do is the repeat and not differently than the first time as well as uh, because it's not a repeat it's just the continuation of the statement happens to be notated with a repeat so I'm not trying to make some effects that are necessary because it disrupts the beauty of the simplicity of the evidence of the line of the well-being that he's instilled. Also, um, to note that the arpeggiation is there to delay the top melodic note. So don't be uh, shy when you think of it. Where do I place a left hand on the arrival note, on the first note, or in between? I think it could be almost at the arrival note. But consider the beat from the arrival note of the melodic line, therefore from the C sharp and not from the D sharp. One, two, three, four, five, six, This way, um, instead of playing loud in the crescendo to the sforzando, you play loud but broader. By delaying the note, you have a crescendo that no crescendo can make. If it was crescendo with the sforzando as it's written, it would be harsh. But because the crescendo arrives in the major ninth of the dominant ninth, of it gives the illusion by the exponential expansion of the elements that you are reaching a plenitude moment of a climax on the dominant. Not only because it's not a seven but a nine, but also because it's delayed. So the sforzando is a, a sforzando of emotional plenitude. You feel like you're fulfilled. It's not just a sforzando of intensity or accent. At least that's how I see it, and that's how I think he extends the three beats into three beats plus. And of course you can argue that this then disrupts the structure of the four four bars of the second half, and I would, th I would say that would be perhaps the rubato. I think it's, it should be. And uh, in other words, not trying to squeeze all these notes that are too many for the space and try to play... <laughs> or too late and too squeezed or not knowing what to do with them in any case we are given an amazingly good um, indication by Beethoven about uh, the whole thing he says it's mezza voce not sotto voce which is most of the cases in the scores where you hear something whispered at the level of the voice uh, but voce sotto voce low voice and mezza voce, middle voice, is what I'm doing now when I'm speaking to you. Instead of being high voiced and trying to speak loud to project like in a speech, here it's just spoken with a natural voice. And perhaps with a big sigh of oh, tenderness. and not to piano pianissimo. The first variation is an elegant slow waltz with the left hand playing the bass and the harmony short long in a slow tempo because it's an andante nevertheless lombardic because it's short long rather than melodic line long short Of course, if you observe the right hand, the two bar 
of 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. You can say perhaps the second bar is a short long 2. After all, even if it's the resolution of the appoggiatura delayed before the re rebuild of the lip of the octave for the next uh, downbeat. If one wants to look at it globally on two bars, the melodic line is in 3, 2. One, two, three. One, two, three. I tend to see hemiolas in everything because I think they are the beautiful bridging of the pulse over the regular pulse that gives us the sense of perpetual slow motion in elegant, um, slow moving gestures, big like Tai Chi. And instead of having the beats correspond in the two hands every bar on every first of three beats, um, every four beats together, therefore the fourth beat. So one, two, three, one, two, three. Four uh, notated uh, dense suggested rhythm or hint of it, like the uh, Sarabande. But in any case, if the right hand is considered by half notes, you'll hear one, two, three. It's under the water. It's the underwater current. But what it does is that it allows you not to slow down since you have a larger step compared to the left hand, which has a shorter step by the quarter and half note or dot and half at best. So you have bar by bar in the left hand, even if there are four bars. Ah, but the melodic line. that the pianist hears innerly the hemiola. You think the pianist hears one, two, one, or three, one. But what is the one is always together and the one is together. So the one has this kind of sense of downbeat or heavy beat, regardless how one thinks of it. Two, three. In a way, thinking of in three half notes over the two bars in the melody in the right hand compared to the left hand counted by the downbeats every three beats, you have this kind of further bridging direction of the phrase line, helpful inner hint in the inner path, inner pace, inner steps. And this way when you speak about further the melodic line's arrival point, direction of the line. It helps to have a larger steps direction line for the melody and shorter steps for the accompaniment, in this case in the left hand in 3-4, and think in 3-2 on the right hand, and in 3-4 in the left hand. the first uh, tempo-wise. Variation of the Goldberg variations, he has have also that. Uh, left hand, 6-8. If you want to look at it, it's subdivided uh, 2 times 3, and the right hand is 3 times 2. One, two three. Because they shouldn't be played, <laughs> and, that, um, and if both are in six eight, you feel like you're constantly off, which is what Schumann will do so well. Oh, it's not the key. Uh, in the finale of the Schumann concerto, one, two, one, two, one, two, a constant 
actually off beat for every two bar uh, beats and then of course every two beats the next one is together and ongoing hemiola and here in the fast tempo it's a playful um, superposition of two pulses <laughs> sort of like, um, uh, to me at least, uh, ping-pong each other, um, mirror each other, and sort of energize each other by their different pulses, and it gives more f f richness and freedom to the, um, to the discourse, because you're not so every time present by the bar lines of the visual or even played, so accents are, without even accents, the synchronization of the downbeat. And in a slow tempo like here, it becomes more difficult to... to identify it because it's so stretched. If one is in 3-2, the other ones one are in 3-4. But what it does is that it does not demonstrate it through an accent like in the faster movement, in the zesty pulses of the Bach, at least played in that tempo example, but it does give you the feeling that you are flowing and floating and rising and not dropping before you arrive at your destination, which would be the dominant eight bars later. I think it is embedded in the writing, even if it does not have to be demonstratively, let's say, accented. <laughs> This time is the proof that you have to play with developmental ideology, so to say, the theme in uh, the repeated um, halves of the theme, which in the variation 2, or II, are developed because they're different. <laughs> he chose to mix the two alternatively, so he reaches the point of the alternative 16th notes by two or by one and then the opposite by interlaced um, dialoguing um, uh, two parts uh, in the in the top part and very um, tender as written teneramente but also lyrical step by step with two parts interlacing each other and you have to observe the direction of the stems in order not to voice always the top one because you make a you would make then an artificial part since it's one color on the piano compared to, let's say, two instruments in the orchestra, I would have different timbres. But you can do it by shadows and lights, by keeping the light on the first, which will be the top stem. And since on the piano instrument you hear the short notes, even when they're not played loud, just because they're replayed, it is a percussive instrument, the length of the uh, half note played louder because it's the end of the first entrance. part which comes above it is in fact the under part. I think the two um, voices interlaced like this are meaningful because um, if not the left hand, which has the ascension by the step of, of the melodic note in the thumb, have it in the left hand, but in the right hand it shouldn't be. This, this is reductive, even if it's effective, because it's beautiful. 
all, perhaps even psychologically more logical in the sense of merging the elements into a some supra line that has like this and that means that I think means that he wanted it to be suggested suggestive of the string quartet writing of the two violins interlaced well that's one thing and then when he goes into the alternative you create the melody of the theme. Sorry for the C natural. Oh, then here. Almost pointillism before the time. You see the contours of the theme appear as you play those enigmatic drops. Not so enigmatic than that. Because they reveal clockwisely immediately the theme. No. You follow the D. And this typical Beethoven accelerando of rhythmical movement of rhythmic articulation that goes faster in one bar you have three harmonies and all of a sudden by the eighth note instead of the quarter note so you don't even have to create a accelerato two, three, two and in the third beat you have two harmonies plus trill which is often the result in sen sensation that you're tripping over your fingers harmony if it was to continue the same calm pace into one beat. If that's not a stretto, I don't know what it is. It's really more than stretto, it's super stretto. And uh, it, it gives this change of gear sensation that you're not going to just stay so calmly into your 3-2 in the hemiola or 3-4 by the down beat, but all of a sudden you have this sudden acceleration. <laughs> awkward and that I think the beauty the awkwardness of it is its beauty and it should be played without um, managing or trying to um, soften the angles by taking more time or trying to make it uh, softer just make it driven forward and, uh, and try to squeeze as many notes in the tree that you can put in of a voice uh and then another element of um, rhythmic stress is that <laughs> he reduces his as I said in the beginning most of us think that he was inspired by the Sarabond of Bach in the Goldberg here he reduces variation ay ay ay, the third variation, into a 2 4. Even if it's by four bars uh, hypermeter, so it's one, two, three, two, three. than I was playing the notes, but in fact I wanted to emphasize the importance of the squareness of this 2-4 compared to the uh, elegant, ambiguous, superposed, different pulse of the 3-4 that allowed to play, or suggestively so, a hemiola, even if slow stretch, on the sort of 3 in the left hand. Why didn't he write D 
this Allegro Vivace variation III or three in Roman uh, writing, obviously. The numerals, oh, why didn't he write it in three? <laughs> After all, it's all we have to do, we not to have to second guess him. But it's nice to be observing the fact that that Allegro Vivace appears even faster because it is in two rather than in three, as if we're missing a beat to get quicker to the point of the half of the phrase. <laughs> and, and that's why he gives that sforzando to enhance even more the um, acacciatura of the secondary dominance leading tone, the famous A sharp that we heard in the beginning. These chromaticisms are more like uh, almost used by Beethoven like adjectives um, to re characterize even more so the already meaning of the word by adding an adjective that gives it a more sharp meaning. And in this case, even without the sforzando, any decently good ear musician would feel that there is some kind of an impulse to give more to this note. Had he written it without the chromatically enhanced A sharp to B and just A natural part of the E major scale. No, if one to give the example, one has to give the example as it could have been. And because of this, even without this for example, just this res reason A sharp brings you to do it. Then the question is, should you on top of that do it more, or should you just do it a little more? Like lifting an eyebrow, or just the whole face transforming. Antique Greek theater when you had the masks for astonishment or happiness and sadness, and so that the spectators from far away can see your sort of emotional pattern face. Here you can say that it's so obvious that it's almost overstating then to Sforzando the Forte with the A sharp uh, alteration on top of it. It becomes farcical, perhaps to a certain extent ironic rather than just driven. It becomes... And I think then the problem is the exaggeration. When you go far and you overshoot your point, like in the second movement. The um, accumulation of overdrives uh, can lead to that, especially when you come from a variation as the one before, the II one, the number two, which is relatively elegantly calm, and all of a sudden you switch gears to the 2-4, which is allegro, you, you tend to overshoot this difference of tempo, but you should try to play lesser that, just let it evolve more, um, so to say, um, Step by step. Because this 2-4 is a variation um, enclaved in ternary 3-4 and the next one, the variation IV-4 in Latin, um, obviously 9-8 uh, returned to this. And so the equivalence of the 8th note by the quarter note, and then he indicates that in the 9 8 you have to play andante but a little bit slower than the theme, so you have to re remember the 3 4 of the theme while playing in 2 4 the allegro. subdivision by three of the three four of the opening but slightly slower I think it's very much like um, oh god shooting shooting 
beyond your comprehension unless you have a conductor who is there to indicate you. Oh, it's too fast. Okay. So have to be your own conductor in the end of the preceding one. in variation IV in front of the drawing of the 9-8 drops by 3 twice and not 2 times 3 he doesn't do 1, 2, 3, 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, 1 he does 1, 2, 1, 2, 3 he does 2 dotted 8s instead of 3 8th notes in the, part, in the pattern of his um, J um, melodic drop of the decoration of the theme, but still keeps in 9 8. So he has an internal hemiola inside each of the beats. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two. He is indicated with a tenuto and accent, so you're not supposed to do. and play it smoothly. Again, it, it acts as if the hemiola of the 3-2 on the 3-4 in the melody as a larger step propulsing element of your um, um, uh, traction forward. And here it's inside the beat. in the sense of three eighth notes per beat on the three beats each then if he had written ta da ta da ta da ta instead of ta 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 he would have really meant it and it would have been more settled because of that it's no more believable because of course I want to prove the point but let's play it very evenly in that sound in, in that option that he didn't do uh... that is not to make fun of it it's plausible it sounds fine uh, to me at least and of course if you play his way variation 3 in the middle is a um, sort of jolt of energy between the preceding and the next following. And if you had done it progressively and we'll go on from variation 2 to 4, we would have had a
divided in the alternative solutions of um, unified pulse or expected verticalizations of the synchronization. It's always as if each hand, each part in each hand has its own pulse, life, expression, move, articulation, even very softly and subtly put under, like in a string quartet, second violin will do a syncopated rhythm or something, but still you hear the following, the melody. Values with inside, you get these cascades of hemiola design. Hemiola design. And he does go to the end of this expression of plenitude. plays the ending of this variation for is to not just play the moving part but play the arriving long part for instance in this cascading drop the bottom part arrival and not just the new entrance because it feels like constantly moving, which it is, but it has to have the elegance to bring the, the line to its arrival point. Since the beginning we could do that. And then the, upper, the answer. above you don't want to finish um, to forget to finish demonstrating the beauty draw and um, the, the elegant graceful draw <laughs> soars in in uh, um, in the playfulness of the two parts not a full-fledged fugue. And so the variation V, victory, or five, obviously, is the one with the contra subject at the get-go as a contradiction by m reversed motion. <laughs> of the dropping thirds by ascending steps, which we heard. It's an imitato, a just imitation game with a reverse exchange of voices, but off the beat with the sforzando on the second half uh, no, uh, bar. to have an enhanced uh, altered note, uh, uh, a cacciaturesque uh, system, as we already know it from the very obvious crescendo of the risen seventh resolution. And here we feel that sense of um, driven height. Uh, chromatic, chromatic. The chromaticism is the adjective of the music. Uh, of course, we have to modulate to secondary dominance rather than modulate, but it appears so far away. We have a C major, which would be, of course, flat six when we had, um, before that, the beginning in E major. I would have been staying in the home garden, but no, we 
have to alter our degrees to expect um, suspect uh, modulation but mostly um, give the listener the impression that something is going off track so <laughs> of um, through altered degrees um, another colorization by harmonic motion <laughs> Energetically, without these interruptions, I'm doing in order to explain him. In a way, I belittle him by doing that. I should not. I should just. No more talk. <laughs> that um, like in the um, prestissimo it's easy to overshoot the dynamic market <laughs> pianissimo instead of forte piano but driven forte and in intense piano rather than a screaming fortissimo and perhaps almost voiceless uh, pianissimo even if it's pianistically I would say enticing because the instrument can perhaps not this quality of the sound in, in by itself or and I think the ear gets um, a bit overwhelmed with the effect which in a way overshadows the thematic treatment so it's like almost deserving it to, that, to over contrast it well while it's so enticing to do the writing and the playing more rather than the writing to write Sforzandi within piano dynamic compared to Sforzandi within forte dynamic. <laughs> appear muffled by the unicorn or the slow depressing of the key, it should be always quick dip, keep quick dip in every dynamic marking. And very often the Sforzandi in Beethoven are justified retroactively by the quality of the bite on the following note. Because if it doesn't exist, then the, if the flaky articulation of the note that falls as Forzando is too weak, or flaky as it is, as it mentioned, then it becomes a spike, and you don't follow the line. But you have to still be able to hear it's a Sforzando, an accent, a, a zesty quality, and then still be able to hear the other ones and not love them down. So the quality of the Sforzando is also in question of balance in order to create a um, um, topography that has uh, the right levels of um, height and lows. Uh, so obviously when you play forte it's tempting to play fortissimo. The sforzando. And when it's piano and he says still sforzando sempre piano it's tempting to play it with hell, like as if you're walking not to wake up the baby. But then, in a way, you swallow it, you don't eject it. Uh, I think it has to have the directive deep, quick, depressing in the key without this gesture, which is ridiculously high. Just for demonstration, but then it becomes a caricature. So, I will try to demonstrate it uncaricatured for the gesture in piano. Sforzando. In forte, sforzando. Uh, 
Gandhi are dubbed for some with the altered degree, in this case. The altered degree by itself, it's already adding to the spice or the zestiness of this forzando. And if it was written in the regular degree... Sorry. But because it's Sinatra, flat minor 6 in E major with the major 3rd. So it's a half major, half minor. And here, it doesn't go full fledged minor. And we turn in major for the next variation, but. Uh, and the final right hand on top has the C sharp and not the C natural that we had earlier. natural sforzando, a beat so, uh, in the dynamic piano with a sforzando. It says it all in the writings, isn't it? This kind of technique of learning how much to um, bring out and how to balance and manage the effects of these appoggiaturas of alternate, 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 alterations. I cannot speak so fast. Anyway, the A sharp being in the second half, obviously the subdomin, the dominance dominant leading tone, and here is a flat six, and here is reason four. So if you take them off to learn it, how much you would have done nothing if there is nothing in terms of um, alterations you would do? That's the regular E major notes. And then if you start adding where he chose to alter, um, raise the A to A sharp, raised 4, or lower C, to six, to C six flat. You feel the rising. Likely for a first time listener, these things pass too fast to be even noted, noticed, or even expressed uh, by the pianist clearly to be absorbed but perhaps sometimes in the quick editing of a let's say um, a chase of a car chase in the film the way the rhythm of the editing makes you keep keeps you on your toes watching it because it translates the the, the let's say the uh, in images tempo the uh, the energy of the speed that uh, if you had a picture every two seconds on each of the two cars chasing each other, you would find it at one point a little bit predictable, so you would not more be on your um, on your toes, so to say. And here Beethoven keeps us psychologically on our toes because as for example, come in the upbeat, they come in held notes, they come on altered notes, and sometimes there aren't altered notes, so he chooses to alternate, but not here. And here to rise and here to lower. in that sense, but I mean part of the regu regular notes of E major. So this kind of um, added colorization um, of the harmony through these um, um, adjectives of the meaning that are the chromaticisms, um, they, they, they bring that spice to it. And of course also give us the indication where to focus our attention and then how to play them while keeping the line, because if we overdo them, they break the line by being too effective, and if we underdo them, we carve the edges and we sort of um, belittle the uh, modernity of the fragmented structure of uh, the melodic line of Beethoven's for his own time. For us, it doesn't seem, almost seems lame because of what we've heard since, but for his time, uh, for his contemporaries, it must have been quite 
something to hear. And um, the conclusion of his um, uh, triptych of last um, variations is a slow rhythmic crescendo, if anything, accelerando, starting with quarter notes of the restatement of the theme into the eighth notes of the ninth eight. Inside the nine eight, then he returns into the C three, three, four, and thirty seconds, which is almost a measured trill. Until he unleashes it in trills, but unmeasured. Cadenza. He combines the fastest note, 30 seconds in values, with the trill, which is the unmeasured fastest. And this trill in the bass and afterwards on the top. the sense of alarming excitement, bubbling excitement, uh, unstoppable shaking in the best sense of the word. Um, that is um, almost like in the Ariette of 111, but he does also there is the same um, rhythmic acceleration by the values that goes to the fastest possible. And um, here, when he reaches that uh, climax of speed and height in terms of the elevation of the range, you wonder where will he go to finish? No, he has to return to the theme. Some say because of the fact that so did Bach in the Goldbergs restate without repeats the theme to conclude. I don't know because nobody would really know uh, if that is the direct idea behind the formal restatement of the theme at the end, which is not used to be done before you finished usually with a climax that followed the um, acceleration of the thematic development in the variations. So you could say, yes, he finished at anticlimactic, or he doesn't choose to have a coda that corresponds to uh, the last variation. I think that we should all respectfully love it like it is, and love it with respect, but also sometimes add to it our own love on top of it. And what if sometimes, in some performances, and most of the time more than some, we overdo a sforzando, we overdo an accelerando, we overstay a pedal, we <clears throat> don't always control the progressive um, um, progression of the elements. Well, I prefer that to the spon in a spontaneous and understood interpretation rather than in something overly calculated and perhaps um, denied of its in-between-the-notes truth. After all, everything is not written in the notation as far as we are concerned is all we have. Nevertheless, it's in between the notes that we sign our interpretation. And I think that um, Thankfully, there is always room for a, not a recomposing of it per se, if that is interpretation for some, but um, re restatement. And I think that the eloquence of the restatement, respectfully disrespecting it sometimes, regardless of the instrument on which it's played, I think is the best way to love it and to share it. The enthusiastic love for it, I think, is more meaningful than the pedantic love for it. And probably a combination of knowledge within the intuition is the best, but not an overwhelming amount. I think ignorance is bliss, and knowledge sometimes is a self 
um, censorship. And uh, ultimately, once you know the piece, you understand the piece to the best of your understanding, and you play it to the best of your capacity to play it, practicing the independence of the voices and the articulations, you reach a point where it only evolves with you and your capacity, and you can bring it further in your own path in life and enrich it by your own experience of life. I think that is uh, the most beautiful part of interpretation. Thank you.